Howdy, folks. So I'd like to tell you a story. It's my story about how I created a social impact game to help juniors at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, learn about the conflict in Syria and through, through immersive play. And I want to tell you how I did that. Okay, so uh, I teach learning technologies at UT Austin, New York Institute of Technology, I'm writing a book on this topic. But I first, I would like to get your input. And so please make some noise. How many people here have never had a chance to design a game? And people here, show of hands, make some noise, okay. How many of you, keep your hands up, would be curious about designing games if you could A, use low tech, and B, if you could do this on a shoestring budget? Okay, okay, more, 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 okay. So think about this. Would it make a difference to you as game designers if, let's say, you could have a process to design a game that could help students with the outcome of the game target actionable competencies? Well, it turn, that they could apply in real life. Right, so it turns out that students want similar things. Right? They actually want to learn in our classes. But the thing is, they want to learn stuff that they can take with them into a career, into a job. They also tell us, and we know this from the Nessie survey, that when they're being engaged, when they're not being engaged. So it's probably not a huge surprise that competency-based education approaches is on the rise. Over 500 institutions last year alone reported some kind of CBE program, right? So my question is, how can games take advantage of this? Well, there's a ton of research. We've heard a lot of research here uh, that studies games and knowledge outcomes, and all of that is really fantastic. But I guess my question is, how can we uh, design a game in which the assessment is baked into the game design itself. So our team at St. Ed's uh, designed a game based on the Model UN project uh, to help students uh, play through the conflict in Syria, but it emphasized more relational um, versus transactional interactions in the game, and it used an active role play to do it. This project was called the Syria Simulation. Now, this simulation was played uh, by, uh, by St. Ed's general education students, uh, and it was delivered in a live one to three hour workshop format. So when I first started to research this conflict, I took a look at the actions that were happening, right? So I started with the social media stuff through the Arab Spring. I took a look at the, the tragedy of Assad bombing his own people. And then I looked at the consequences of that, right? The loss of life and all the destruction. And I took those actions and I turned them into variables in the game. I started with basic, basic threshold concepts, and those variables then got turned into levers that served to flip the mechanics of the game one way or another. I then took those mechanics, and then I sketched out a really imperfect structure using math, and I tried to balance how those levers were going to get flipped and when. And so I took a look at things like the exponential rise of refugees over the rounds of play, the exponential rise in, in casualty counts, et cetera. I then mapped out one sequence, one round of play, and I had to do that as a way to help my colleagues follow the action and to see when the levers of the game and the mechanics of the game were going to get flipped and why they were going to get flipped. So you might be asking, can you really do something like this in under an hour? And I would say I have a couple of caveats. A, I'm not talking about researching the content because goodness knows I'm not an expert in geopolitics, uh, but the actual sketching of the game itself can go very, very quickly. So I'm suggesting that you can take one intervention in one class, take one problem that you would like to pick apart, pick out one threshold concept that characterizes that problem, and then ask yourself, what and why are students having problems with this particular concept, right? What are some of the stumbling blocks that they may have? What are some of the misconceptions? What are some of the confounding variables in their own learning? Use that information to design your own levers that will help your game to, to move and for them to be able to play it. Then prototype it out. Sketch something out on paper. It doesn't have to be really fancy. A really a super simple sketch that basically sketches out the choices that are possible, the consequences of those choices, uh, the decisions that they can make, which can lead to more choices and define your game's possibility space. And then test out your game mechanics. But only after you do that, worry about dealing with the assets. I think sometimes we overemphasize that. But then involve students in the process. Make this uh, something that is very easy for them to get, make the consequences for failure low, but prepare to fail. 
right? We did, certainly the first time. We delivered this to eight students. We didn't even have enough people to cover all the actors in the game. There were 12 different organizations. But by the end, we delivered this to 700 students over the course of the semester. So what I'm suggesting is that we take an approach that targets competencies and outcomes and that gets students moving and talking and thinking and learning as they play. Now, obviously, there's a lot more that we can say about this, but my hope is that you can take some of these ideas about games and learning and competencies and authentic assessment and design a game that will help your students target actionable competencies. My name is Jason Rosenblum. Thanks, you guys, for listening.